Welcome everyone to our Trade Policy Research Forum webinar for July. Um, our topic today is services in the India EU FTA. We've got uh, a great main presenter, Hildegun Nordas uh, from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. We've got discussion comments from Amrita Saha, who's at the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. Um, before we get into it, let me say a few words uh, about the forum. Uh, my name is Ben Shepherd. I'm here with my co-founder, Hannah Norberg. Um, we started the Trade Policy Research Forum uh, nearly three years ago now as an online community uh, dedicated to the discussion and uh, uh, dissemination of all kinds of trade policy uh, research. You can tell from our logo that bridges are important to us. Uh, so something that we try to do is to build bridges Firstly, between research and practice. Uh, so we love to have researchers giving papers, but we always want to talk to them about the practical implications of what they're saying. Um, we also have practitioners come and present and talk to us. So we tried to build uh, this bridge between research and practice. We also try to build bridges uh, between the different parts of the trade policy community. That is to say, economists, lawyers, policy professionals, uh, development professionals, um, and uh, everyone who's involved in uh, trade policy. Uh, then, of course, the other type of bridge that we try to build is between the global centres of trade policy, like Washington, D.C., Brussels, and Geneva, and the rest of the world that is dealing with trade policy, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. Um, so a big objective that we have is to recreate something a little bit like a brown bag seminar that is accessible to a wide range of people uh, around the world. And I think today is a great example of that. Uh, Hildegun is going to be presenting uh, a, a fantastic research paper. We'll have discussion comments, and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. Um, before I hand over to Hannah to uh, introduce the speakers, I'll just remind you that if you have questions and comments for our speakers, please feel free to put them either in the chat box that you can see on Zoom or in the Zoom uh, Q&A feature. And Hannah and I will moderate the Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. Um, so that's enough from me. Over to you, Hannah, to uh, introduce our speakers. Hi, thank you so very much for that, Ben. I am so excited to be here today and I'm always so excited about the TPR Forum and we're almost turning three, right? And um, so welcome everybody. I see some of our friends. I know some of these people, right? So extra welcome to all of those who are new of course, but also super nice to see Martha here and Pascal and Ivan. It's so good to see you guys. Now, you guys have been here before. You know that we always, 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 always run out of time. You know, I'm not lying about that. So please do post your questions as soon as you come up with them in the Q&A or in the comment session, because that's the only way that we can get to them. We always run out of time. We always run out of questions. So don't tell me later that I didn't tell you this. Um, because that's the only way that we can get them in here. So uh, Ben, of course, already presented the speakers. So I'm just going to reiterate that. We are extraordinarily happy to have Hildegun and Amrita here to, uh, to join us today. So for the Hildegun knows, everybody who knows services knows Hildegun. She's sort of like Kilroy, like, you know, Kilroy was here. Uh, Hildegun has been there if it's services. And she's also... Uh, we were just talking about that before we came on. She's also a returning speaker here. We're thrilled to have her back. In the beginning, when we started out, we wanted some legendary speakers so that we started to look really good from the beginning. And Hildegun joined us. So we're so thrilled to have her back. Um, and so then also we have Amrita Saha, who is um, a research fellow at the Institute of uh, Development Studies in the UK. Uh, and so super welcome, everybody. Uh, without further ado, I think we're going to hand it over to Hildegun. Yes, Ben? Sounds good. All right, Hildegun, the, the floor or the mic is yours. I think you're muted, Hildegun. That has to happen before yeah. we can start a webinar. It's, it's not a true webinar unless someone's muted. It's not. So thank you for yeah. getting that out of, you know, out of the way in the beginning. Okay, so thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. So let me just share my screen. And, um, and um, yeah, I guess this is the full screen picture as well. Works well. Yeah, just that um, it's 
Okay. Okay, so this uh, this paper is really uh, asking an hypothetical question. And uh, the uh, question is, uh, what would be the impact of the, uh, the FTA between uh, EU and India, which is currently under negotiation, under negotiations? And it's focusing on the services sector. So uh, let me just go very quickly to uh, the background and motivation. Why do I want to look at this? So um, this is uh, something that has been a very long time in the making. So the European Union and uh, India started to negotiate the free trade agreement in 2007. And then it was suspended in 2014. And uh, June last year, it was resumed, and uh, and now the negotiations are underway. And uh, to both of these countries uh, or parties, the uh, services sector is very important, and um, they are also kind of have ambitions to uh, lead the way in uh, in the digital transformation of services and also. To, uh, to set the standards for the digital economy and, uh, and how to deal with data and uh, cybersecurity and uh, also artificial intelligence. So it's interesting from that point of view to look at, uh, at services. It also seems like there is little appetite for deep FDIs for the moment. And this could kind of set the standard for a 21st century agreement between two very big economies. And one is uh, a developing country and the other a developed country. So really interesting case. And uh, another issue is that uh, when countries start to uh, negotiate FTAs, they're is uh, often a legal obligation to do an impact assessment upfront. So uh, my ambition here is uh, to show how to do that, at least one way of doing it. So uh, I would like to, um, to show how it can be done using the OECD SGRI database. So I think that's, uh, that's also an important contribution here. So what... Um, what I want to do is, um, or uh, the methodology and how I did this was to look into uh, the FTA text. So that is posted on the uh, European Union uh, website. And uh, it's possible to uh, compare the text in the FTA and then look at what are the current laws and regulations in, in each country looking at the SGRI and then identify in which area countries need to change the regulation and trade policy to comply with this text and, and then do a counterfactual analysis. Of course, this text is very preliminary. It's the proposed text without any schedules or reservations and these kind of issues that will surely be part of the final agreement. So I don't think for a moment that this will be the end result of these negotiations. But I think it's still very useful to, to set kind of the, the clean proposed text as a benchmark. And then one can see what happens if, uh, if uh, both parties introduced reservations and, and schedules with, uh, with lists open approaches than what you see in, in the initial tip. So this shows you just the, um, the trade services trade pattern between uh, the European Union and uh, India up to 2019. And you see that trade in absolute terms are quite balanced between the two parties. But if you look at the relative importance you see that India has a very small share of EU's total export, while the European Union is quite important for, for India as an exporter. 
So this picture you can keep in mind because uh, that will explain some of the results that we see later. So just keep in mind that um, the European Union is much more important for India than, uh, than India is for the European Union. So to the data I've used here, the uh, obvious candidate is of course the OECD SDRI database, which uh, provide the information on uh, what kind of trade policies and barriers uh, each party has. And then also standard is the SEPI gravity database where you have all the, uh, the standard gravity um, variables. And then the one that is a bit controversial, I would say is the OECD WTO BATIS database. So it's a balanced uh, data on trade and services. And the reason it's a bit controversial is that uh, a lot of the uh, entries in this database has been um, estimated using gravity. So you have quite a bit of an endogeneity problem here. I would talk a bit more about this in the Q&A, why I still think it's, it's the best uh, database if, um, if uh, somebody asks, but um, for now, I think I'll leave it at that. And then I also needed the OECD WTO trade and value added database. And I needed that to calculate internal trade. So I need internal trade to identify the impact of, uh, of uh, trade policies that are kind of unilateral in many cases. And, um, and then what I did was just, uh, you have the gross output and total export in the uh, trade and value added database. So then you get internal trade from that. So the methodology is plain vanilla gravity, but uh, the uh, kind of state of the art version where you use uh, fixed effects and internal trade and uh, PPML with the uh, zeros and, uh, and all these things. So then what I did was to create a counterfactual. And uh, I started off with uh, a counterfactual FTA dummy. So that simply means that um, using the gravity database, there you have dummies for FTAs. And then I just changed the FTA dummy from zero to one when the country pairs were one where EU and the other India in, uh, in all these possible pairs and then ran a simulation. So I think the reason why this can be useful is that most analysis looking at uh, the impact of FDA does that and also to get uh, a contrast towards the more granular approach which is using the SGRI simulator. And then I won't go into the uh, equations here, but it's just um, kind of um, of, uh, of calculating the, uh, the um, what do you call them? The um, multilateral resistance terms and, uh, and then the counterfactual, both trade flows and, and the production. So that's kind of plain vanilla. It's, uh, it's reasonably new, but uh, it's, uh, it's not much contribution in this paper to develop that methodology is simply using it. So then to how you can use the SGRI simulator to do this. So basically what I did was to look at the, uh, the FTA text and go through it kind of paragraph by paragraph and identify which areas uh, that countries need to liberalize. So this is just to show you one example. And that is in the text, it says that there should be no requirements that uh, board members in any company should be national. So then you pick up that requirement and then you go to the SDRI database and you look for are there any sectors where any of these countries have a requirement that the board members need to be a national? 
And for India, that is the case for telecommunications. So then what I did was just to change that from yes to no. And then you see that uh, had an impact on the um, STRI score, which went from 0.334 to 315. So that is just one entry, but this I did for all the uh, all the provisions in the in the agreement, the text of the agreement, and then I got something like this. So here you see the counterfactual policy for computer services. So here you see the blue bars. That would be the MFN SDRIs for all the countries involved in in this trade agreement. And then you see the black bars. Those are the infra EEA, European Economic Area. So there are SDRIs for them as well. So they apply when the country pair are both a member of the uh, European Economic Area. And then you have the uh, counterfactual preferential with India. So you see that the preference margin here is uh, significant in for some of the countries. For some, it's almost nothing. And, uh, and I'll get back to this, which is a bit a strange one. And that has to do with movement of people. But uh, I can get back to that later. But you see that um, the preference margin according to this FDA is not trivial for most um, EU countries to India and, uh, and um, also for India. Uh, telecommunications. And here you see the preference margin for EU countries in India is really big. And uh, also quite, um, quite uh, substantial or significant for, for um, India getting into the European Union. So plugging these counterfactual, or no, the, this is not the counterfactual. So this is just uh, running the structural gravity using the SGRIs. And uh, what is notable here is first that it looks like uh, Kind of a standard gravity, so it's reassuring that uh, that it's uh, kind of looks normal. And then what is uh, worth noticing here is this um, dummy, which is called external, and that picks up whether the country pair are two different countries or whether it's internal trade. And you see that uh, there is quite a huge uh, home bias. In, in services. And then the free trade area dummy doesn't really make much of an impact when we control for whether both countries are EU members. But what you can also see is that the STRI has a rather large impact on trade. So this is um, using total services trade and then plugging in the STRI for the sectors that are specifically mentioned in, uh, in the trade agreement one by one. And the reason why I wanted to run it on total services is that most of these sectors are really kind of facilitating total trade, particularly finance and insurance and telecoms. So that's, uh, that's why I wanted to, to do that. And what this, coefficient means is that if the um, SDRI increases by one standard deviation, then trade would fall by um, 75%. So it's, um, it's quite a large impact. So then just look at uh, the uh, simulation results. If um, we just run this with the FDA dummy, so you see that total exports from the European Union would change very little. India's total export would increase by a bit more than five, five, six percent. 
And then there would be quite a bit of trade diversion from other countries EU to India. So we see quite a bit of, uh, of an effect on, on trade between the two countries, but not much on total trade from for either of the countries. And then I've used the uh, SGRI counterfactuals. You see the results here, and it's, uh, it's, just, um, it's just a table here, but uh, you see that total exports of services for EU is increased by about 1%. And I distinguished between finance, or I included financial services and communication services. So that's separate uh, estimations for those. And uh, you see that they increase a bit, but not all that much. For India, you see total exports increases by 25%. And for financial services, about five, six, and the communications, about three and a half. But then when we look at EU exports from EU or exports from EU to India, it's a pretty large increase, doubling or more. And remember that uh, the preference margin for EU companies in India would change a lot. And um, and uh, EU exports to India is not all that big in the first place. So, for instance, if India opened its financial sector to uh, to investment and trade for EU, you would expect to see something big from a low basis. And then we also see a bit of trade diversion here. And uh, what you see in the last column is. Um, something that some of you might be interested in. But the problem here was that um, the base year in the regression is 2018. And at that point, uh, the UK was a member of the European Union. And uh, the simulation results is, of course, for a year when the UK is not the member of the European Union. So what I did here was to, uh, to run a simulation with both the EU-India free trade agreement and Brexit. So what you see the big decline in intra-EU trade, that's basically because uh, the UK is no longer a member. So it doesn't have all that much to do with, uh, with this trade agreement. So, okay, so that's uh, the main results. So let me just, um, make some concluding remarks, and uh, I think I'm good on time. So what I tried to do here is to demonstrate how the SDRI simulator can be used for impact analysis. And this can be done, of course, for any trade agreements where you have uh, the, the parties included in the, uh, in the SDRI. And, uh, what is also important here is the role of, uh, of telecommunications for services trade. And this result I found here, but I've done quite a few papers on, on services trade and looking at, um, at the trade barriers. And I always find this for telecommunication. So bearing in mind that that is kind of the infrastructure over which particularly cross-border trade in services is run. It's not surprising, but um, it's also something to bear in mind. And um, I think it's also uh, providing some insights on, uh, on FTAs between uh, countries of uh, different levels of, of income. So you saw kind of a pretty unbalanced outcome. So it's it's not the same outcome for EU exports to India as the other way around. You saw it's uh, it's quite um, different in the two cases. And one important limitation is that mode three is not included in the analysis. 
And that is because we don't have the data for mode three. And um, and uh, to be uh, to be honest, mode three is of course included in the STRI indicators. So you could you could argue that there is kind of a mismatch between the policy measures and uh, and the trade measures. Having said that, I think it's it's also pretty clear that uh, mode three is complementary rather than um, than a substitute for uh, for cross border trade. Most studies find that. So um, in that sense, it shouldn't be a huge problem, but uh, it's still a problem. But uh, nothing that uh, we could do much about in uh, in this analysis. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to the comments and uh, the discussion. Thanks so much, Hildegun. That was really great. I'm, I'm both a services guy and a gravity modeler. So this is like the ideal paper for me. I can't wait to, uh, to talk more about it um, and really appreciate you keeping the time. I know it's very, very hard to do, um, but we really do appreciate that. Let me hand straight over to uh, Amrita for her discussion comments. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, let me just say thank you, Hannah and Ben, for uh, inviting me. And uh, it's great to share the platform with Hildegun and then see her after several years. Um, I'll, I'll try to structure my comments in uh, four areas. So uh, unlike Ben, I don't think I can claim any expertise on, on gravity or on services, but I do work on India, uh, UK, India, EU trade, more generally looking at trade and development. Um, my first um, uh, comment or really reflection is that I think overall, the, the detailed analysis in the paper of the proposed FTA text sort of combining you know, what is currently applied in terms of services trade policy, considering domestic regulations with the draft text of the agreement. I think this is really valuable because this gives the opportunity to do the ex ante impact analysis, which you want to do with, you know, FTA negotiations. Um, we, of course, haven't been able to do similarly for UK, India. So I definitely see the EU, India example as really um an important one and you know more importantly i think it's trying to unpack services um in ftas at a quite a granular level so i'm i'm hoping that this is replicable for eu with with other countries so just to, just related to that i think um you know hildegun explained quite well in her presentation but possibly some detail on how this matching um, how sort of the draft agreement was uh, reviewed and matched with the STRI might be helpful for those uh, either involved in the negotiations or informing the negotiations, and also in terms of this being replicable in other uh, contexts. So that was sort of my first um, area. Uh, the second, um, I think in terms of um, sort of conceptually and, and in terms of methods, I think the approach of sort of capturing the variation in internal trade costs is really interesting. Um, you know, domestic regulation is, of course, such an important part of services trade costs. And the fact that it varies within the EU is not always sort of um, picked up. Uh, I imagine there are issues to capture regulatory differences across states in India, um, because, of course, the, the presence is quite different but it might be um, interesting if, if that was possible somehow. Um, it's also interesting to see that there's sort of this large negative effect for telecommunications. Um, but what we also see in the paper is that some of the details in terms of um, uh, quotas, labor tests, these are also sort of within the scope of the simulation. So I think that really gives a lot of substance um, for those sort of uh, directly involved um, in, in sort of the negotiations. Third, I think from a very practical um, perspective, services trade uh, is increasing between India and EU. Um, of course, services trade is, is uh, quite large also between India and UK. So this is just probably a slightly a sidetrack, but um, learning from sort of working with Ben a little bit, uh, I know about embodied financial services. And since we are talking about services here, and, you know, India has been using uh, GSP, the Generalized System of Preferences, for several years. Um, 
And of course, moving to the FTA removes the associated uncertainty with GSPN graduations. I wonder if we were to look at embodied services for manufacturing, because you know, uh, India EU trade and manufacturing is quite large. Are there also sort of you know interesting um, things to unpack? Um, of course, EU is India's third largest trading partner, so you know there's something um, hopefully uh, going on there. Um, I can see that, of course, 2018 was the was the baseline. That's what um, Hildegard explained. Of course, firms, um, Indian firms trading with the UK, a lot of the motivation was access to EU markets. So with that changing, um, I wonder uh, what are the implications there? Again, I'm thinking in terms of both services itself, but also services are sort of um, embodied in manufacturing. Um, in my final area uh, of uh, comment, uh, and this is, of course, you know, really to say this is not captured in the paper, but um, sort of from a political economy perspective, you know, there were several rounds of negotiations between India and EU, and it finally failed in 2013, 2014. Uh, negotiations are being done separately, trade, investment protection, geographical indications. And when we look at services, of course, there are aspects across all these three areas. This is a strategic partnership. Um, and, you know, India, of course, rejected integration into several Asian trade alliances. So the India-EU uh, agreement, of course, it hasn't, you know, uh, there's sort of this ambitious deadline with FTAs these days, and you know the UK had one, and now the EU has one for 2024. Um, but you know, I just I'm just sort of reflecting on sort of the actual practical um, uh, issues with these negotiations because there are still quite a lot of difficult concessions to agree on both sides. And why I'm making this point is because in this paper, again, um, I think I said this before is, is some of the you know labor test requirements, etc., is actually integrated into the analysis. So I think that's really uh, important to highlight uh, because there might be quite a lot of differences in principles and vision when we think about India and EU in terms of sustainability requirements. But, you know, what are the possibilities of alignment? Of course, negotiations are exactly for that. But if there are intersections um, uh, and, you know, the fact that sort of we are able to unpack specific sectors with this kind of approach, I think, uh, it would be really valuable evidence for those involved in um, directly in the negotiations. So I'll stop there. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll have quite a lot of questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Amrita. That's great. Let, let me hand it straight back to Hildegun to see if she'd like to respond uh, to those, I, I think, really useful and interesting comments. Yes, so thank you so much for the comments. They are all well taken. And um, so, yeah, explain better how the matching is done. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a valid one because, um, yeah, particularly practitioners would uh, would probably like to uh, to see that. So, sure, that's uh, and then the internal trade cost. Uh, I think that's um, that's an interesting point. Actually, what I did. To, uh, to include internal trade cost was to use the uh, STRI for barriers to competition as, uh, as an indicator for internal trade cost. So then basically I get uh, three different uh, STRIs for, for the EU countries and India. So you have internal trade cost, which is uh, barriers to competition and that applies to everybody and uh, into including local trade. And then you have um, the intra-EA, which applies to, uh, to uh, the other EU countries and uh, Norway and um, Iceland as well. And then you have uh, the MFN and, and then you have the, uh, the India preference margin. So those are kind of the different different um, dimension of, of trade costs that, uh, that I use. And uh, yeah, it would be super interesting to look at regulatory differences across uh, Indian states. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there were somebody at the Indian Institute for Foreign Trade that, uh, that tried to do something like that at one point. So if I could lay my hands on 
on those data, it would uh, definitely be something that would be interesting to do. And uh, just to pick up on, on that note, I went to a conference uh, last week um, organized by the ADBI and the University of Tokyo. And there was a very interesting paper presenting. Um, so basically what they did was to analyze the impact of the COVID lockdown on intra-Indian trade. And they used the, uh, the information on this uh, goods and services tax, which apparently had information on transactions across um, Indian uh, state borders and uh, made a very nice um, paper out of that. So that's definitely something that uh, that could be looked into. The GSP, that's a very good point. I hadn't really thought about it and, uh, and how that uh, applies to, um, to uh, kind of Indian access to European services market, but um, it's a very good point. So, uh, I'll look into that. And then I also think it's uh, it's a very good point, the one you raised about the UK and uh, and uh, India's motivation for engaging with EU. So that is probably something that could be done. Actually, these data has been updated to 2020 now. So uh, I can I can look again. I'm actually doing that because I'm revising the paper for the journal, so I'm about to uh, to rerun it for up to 2020, and uh, then it might be possible to do something more also on uh, the Brexit dimension. So we got in the strategic partnership. Uh, I think that's also something that is really interesting. Maybe too big for this paper, but uh, something to think about going forward. So thank you so much. Very helpful. That's great. I, I think we've got a lot of uh, sort of useful directions uh, for the discussion to go off in. Let, let me remind people you can post questions in the chat or the Q&A and Hannah and I will uh, get them into the discussion uh, with both Hildegun and, and Amrita. Um, let me start off, Hildegun, with, with something. It's, it's, it's my question, but it's motivated by something that's come up in the chat. So the comment that was made in the chat was that, you know, it's, it's not a, a sort of a small deal that the analysis that you're doing uh, does not have mode three in it. And I get why it doesn't have mode three, but I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the data sources that people can use for this sort of modeling. So it seems to me that when we talk about modeling uh, to do with services trade, we've got a choice of using uh, something like Bartis. Uh, we've got Tismos at the WTO, and we've got the multi-region input output table. So there's there's Wild, there's GTAP, there's Eura, uh, there's ADB, and there's uh, Tiva. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the pros and the cons of each of these sources, and then why you opted for the ones that you did, even though there is this limitation about mode three. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is of course something that uh, that we struggle with everybody that uh, that work on trade and services because it is truly a problem. And uh, having said that, it's it's also a problem for trading goods because there you also have uh, FDA and FATS kind of. Uh, it's much bigger than uh, than cross border trade, and uh, they are also probably connected, and you cannot uh, you cannot link them in terms of, of policy analysis. So I think it's it's a problem uh, whatever trade policy analysis you do, and for the databases, uh, I the referees on on this suggested I look at uh, one what is called. Uh, let me just have a quick look and see if I can find what it's called. It's um, ITPDE. Ah, yes. ITPDE. 
And uh, so there are many databases out there. And what they have in common is that um, a lot of, uh, of observations are estimated one way or another. And uh, one of the reasons why I chose uh, this uh, WTO uh, OECD database on balance trade is that for every entry in the database, you have information on how it's estimated. Mm -hmm. Is it raw data? Is it uh, kind of using mirror data? Or is it using information on there being no trade at all for the zeros? And, um, and then quite a substantial part is estimated using, using gravity. So what I'm doing also in the revised version is to use only the data that uh, has not been estimated Using, uh, using gravity and the results are pretty much the same. Also because the countries and uh, the level of aggregation that I use here, there are not all that many um, estimations using gravity. And that's another problem I have with the, the suggested database because um, it's built from uh, kind of bottom up. Mm -hmm. And what statistical agencies do, if uh, I've got this right, is to build it top down because they have much better information on total trade than on sectoral trade and bilateral trade. So if, uh, if you start with uh, the totals, you are much better off than if you try to start with the, the details and then aggregate it up. So the database in question doesn't really have total services trade. And, uh, and that, um, that is an issue, I think. So what I prefer to do is to run, um, to run sensitivity analysis with only the data that uh, has not been, been estimated. But then to mode three, I'm aware of these, uh, the database with, uh, with all four modes. It's, um, I had trouble with the using the one that I use, and I think I would get into more trouble still if uh, we use that or because, and even that one has kind of a separate database for, for mode three. So um, it's, um, but if mode three, is complementary to the other modes so that they move together. And I think there is a lot of evidence for that. And I can just tell you, um, we did an analysis using micro data on this and looking at, um, at services firms and uh, manufacturing and services firms and um, kind of trying to, uh, to tease out the pure services exporters that do not do uh, fats and do not do, uh, do um, goods trade. And they are only a tiny, tiny share of, of the total. Almost all services exporters also do, uh, do FDI and fats. So I think we are reasonably okay with them. Um, with uh, looking at the, the trade data, but um, but of course it would be even better if we had the great data on both mode three and um, and the other modes. I know if if only we had national statistics officers in the audience so that we could tell them to collect this stuff as uh, we do it. I think every services conference I've ever been to. Um, let me ask you one more technical question before we get to some big picture stuff. So uh, in the Q and A. Um, someone has asked if you can describe in a little more detail how you calculate the total effects for the EU. And where the question is going is that when you think of the EU, uh, I mean, the data that you've got is the sum of the individual uh, kind of member country uh, figures. So how do you go about summing all of that, given that there are third country effects within the EU as well? Like, is it is it a straightforward sum or is there something else, uh, some other magic that you perform? 
So uh, the uh, it's just a, a summary table that I showed you, but uh, the uh, the estimates are done on a bilateral basis. So it's basically each individual European Union country and its trade with uh, other EU countries, India and third countries. So it's it's really the estimation is run on uh, on individual countries and then for the table that I presented, I just uh, I just summed it up. So that's um, and as you could see from the the charts where I showed you the counterfactuals, it's actually not the same the same um, preference margin mm -hmm. for India in uh, in all the EU countries because we also have uh, some areas in domestic regulation here where EU countries differ among themselves. So, uh, so that means that, um, that the preference margin for, for India in, in different EU countries would, uh, would vary. So it's really run country by country. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Hannah, would you like to jump in with a question? Uh, always. Uh, so there's a severe thunderstorm and really hard rain here. So in case I break up, that's why. Um, so my question to Hildegun, it's such an honor to have you here and it's so much fun to have these discussions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take on, um, you know, the young researchers out there because nobody knows services like Hildegun does. So I have two questions for her and then I have more for Amrita, but Hildegun, what is the one area that you think that young researchers should be working on? What is the thing that you're like, I wish somebody brought this. This is something that is super interesting, or this is a database that it's underused, or this is something that would really unlock, because you're one of those really rare people who go really deep into research, and then you also lean into policy. So you are that bridge that we have in the logo. And so what is it that you would tell the up and coming, uh, you know, these are the things that I never get, I never have the time to do this, but I wish somebody else did this, right? That, that's, my, that's my first question to you. Uh, that's a great question. And, uh, and thank you very much for, for raising that because this is uh, this is an issue that I'm really kind of passionate about, and uh, and I think it's we live in the data age and we are swimming in data and we are almost drowning in data and we complain we can't do services research because we don't have data. I think that's uh, that's really uh, kind of um, it's not a great idea. So. And let me just pick up a couple of things. So I told you I was at this conference in uh, in Tokyo last week, and there were some great papers being really innovative in in using data and uh, and that. so I mentioned the uh, the analysis using the uh, information from the taxes, the goods and services taxes. So that's one. But then there were also other papers. So one looked at um, firms using QR codes on, uh, on um, the trading uh, platforms. So then, of course, the platform would have information on their volumes of trade and, uh, and uh, how they perform. So that actually made them... Um, had a, a very significant positive impact for their access to credit. And uh, you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff where you can actually use information from, uh, from the internet. So you have information from payment services where you have transaction level analysis, and then you can link this to, um, to policy measures and aggregate it up, but you can also look at uh, at firm performance and uh, and uh, yeah. So you have you have a lot of stuff where you can where you can actually use uh, 
and micro data and and data from from the internet you have um, you also have in the digital economy you get uh, you can get information from the big platforms some of them are pretty helpful there was also a pretty interesting paper using information on um, what was it uh, app download downloads on the uh, on the um, the big platforms, and then you could see which country the um, provider of the app came from and which country the downloads came from. So there is so much interesting stuff that uh, that young and ambitious researcher with the requirement to publish and do. I love that. And I'm just also going to ask for everybody who's on here, both you guys are on LinkedIn. Right. And so is it all right if people reach out and continue the conversation if they, you know, are a little too shy to post those questions here or, you know, come in for an encore to watch the recording later, uh, if that's all right. So in that case, Ben, is it all right if I ask Amrit that question too? All right. Okay. So Amrita, my question for you then is because you work in the more the policy sort of leaning um issues so my question for you is working it's it's different india are notoriously difficult to negotiate with i don't think that's a secret for anybody in, in this call uh or you know in the trade sphere in general um so and india is your specialty but development economics in general or development economies in general where do you think what sort of argument where where's the policy space what sort of questions or um, issues do you think can either move the needle for Indian policymakers to move in and really say, okay, you know, let's do this, let's get this done. We've been working on this, you know, since 20, 2007. This was one of the first FTAs I worked on. Um, and then the joke was that that has been going on since Napoleon, but uh, but officially. So where do, where do you think the space is to get these movements and what sort of research can be done to persuade or open up the conversation or get the uh, energy flowing there, the momentum? Where, where What do you think can unlock things or should yeah, be done to unlock? Yeah, no, thanks, Anna. I think that's a very interesting question, one that I you know, I've been asking myself for several years. Um, I used to work in India uh, trade policy before um, I, I moved. So um, I think, um, you know, while, of course, uh, India is negotiating and has signed, um, you know, early harvest agreements, trade agreements, um, I think it is no secret that India's policy space is still kind of constrained because of lots of development challenges, you know, poverty is high, jobs, inequality. Uh, and this is something actually um, at IDS we have taken up. So we are trying to link uh, trade transactions data with household level data to see some of the impact of trade policy changes or trade shifts on sort of poverty outcomes, inequality outcomes, also changes in jobs. And I think Hilda could mention some really interesting examples of using micro level data to, to create evidence. So I think while, um, you know, as trade economists, we are, we are generating quite interesting and important evidence on sort of, you know, the trade policy effects and sort of, you know, what are the gains? Uh, it is also important to look into uh, the development impacts. And I think in the case of India in particular, if there is hard evidence, for example, you know, if the EU-India uh, trade agreement can also bring some tangible um, benefits, which can, you know, either um, contribute to poverty reduction or in some way, of course, trade doesn't, cannot give you all the answers, right? But there are, you know, the distributional consequences of trade policy changes. And I think in the case of India and also in developing countries, I think the two need to go hand in hand. Um, for EU India, there's a lot of debate around human rights, labor, and, you know, all of these, I think in Hildegan's paper, um, uh, she looks into the labor test requirements, et cetera. And I think that's really important. But I think having sort of the trade and development evidence, I think that might move the needle to answer your question. Uh, in, in my perspective. 
Thank you so much for that. Ben, I'm going to hand that back because you probably have some, you probably have some, um, some intake on, the, on both of those, I'm assuming. Yeah. So, I, I, you know. I do. Uh, yeah, let me actually just follow up with, with uh, Amrita. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying and I think it's really important. And, um, you know, we have the tools to do some of this work that you're describing. So, uh, you know, when, when Alan Winters was at the World Bank, he sponsored a lot of this sort of work to look at the poverty impacts of trade policy and all the rest. So, um, you know, I get that it needs to be done specifically for India, but, you know, thinking of this from both the UK perspective, because they're surfing on this wave as well, and the EU perspective, how do you try and get your trade agreement into a different kind of thought space from something like RCEP, where India went all the way nearly to the finish line and then said, actually, no, it's not for us. How do you try and create a different outcome? Is it just a matter of having the research base there to say, okay, well, this agreement is different because it's going to do more for development or it's going to give us better market access or, or something? Or, or is there something else in the political economy of it that we need to be paying attention to? I think there are two things, Ben. One is, of course, the development side, but one is the geopolitics of it. And, you know, we know why India, of course, sidestepped RCEP. Uh, and I think Hildegard started a presentation by talking about sort of the lack of appetite for deep agreements. Um, anything, I, I think, which kind of um, signs, for example, you know, India sidestepped RCEP because there was sort of the possibility of having sort of that deeper commitment. So I think while um, um, India, as well as, I mean, I think current FTA negotiations that are happening globally are looking into, you know, making steady progress. There is also sort of this, I think, um, expectation of sort of still holding on to some policy space, some maneuver. So I think the geopolitics is quite different from the development angle. Um, and I think the development angle in terms of, for example, showing excellent impacts on poverty or inequality, you know, Actually, we're working with Alan to do that for UK India. It's quite complicated, but I think now that we have more micro level granular data mm -hmm. at the household level, geo coded, it's, it's possible. Um, so it's become increasingly possible to, to extend that literature in ways that can, I think, hopefully inform uh, uh, also FTA negotiations. Yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe if I can wrap up, I mean, this has been a fantastic. Uh, webinar for, for me. I think it's exactly the type of webinar that we want to do because we started off uh, with a paper that is uh, answering a policy question, um, but using data and technique to do that. And then we've gone all the way from there to talking about the political economy of the agreement, development policy and everything else. And I think that's exactly uh, the sort of thing that we want to do here. Um, so let me thank uh, both Hildegun uh, for presenting her paper and Amrita for giving us some really great comments and food for thought in uh, the discussion. Um, let me thank everyone as well uh, for being in the audience and for sharing uh, your questions and comments uh, today. I think we've had a, a lively discussion. There have been some technical questions, um, some questions of principle, and I, I think we've gotten across uh, a really wide range of uh, territory. Before we uh, call it a day, let me uh, plug our next uh, webinar. We're going to be taking August uh, off since uh, uh, that's our, our tradition at the forum, um, but we will be back in September. So on September 28th, uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. It won't be a research paper. Uh, we're going to be having a careers session. Um, so we've got a panel of experts who are going to be talking specifically about the question of how to get started in a trade policy career. Um, so we'll be having them talk about their own experiences of how they got started. And also where we have uh, more experienced people, we'll be talking about what they look for uh, when they're recruiting staff at a kind of junior or intermediate level. Um, we've got a mix of people. We've got economists, we've got policy specialists, uh, we've got a lawyer. Uh, we've got people working in the private sector, the public sector, the big international organisations. Um, so it should be a really great panel. Um, so if you're a student or a young researcher, um, I think it's a session uh, that you wouldn't want to miss. 
Keep an eye out uh, in your email when you get a, a, an email from Zoom uh, in about 24 hours time, it will give you a sign up link. And of course, we will start posting about this on uh, social media in September. So again, thank you very much uh, to our presenters. Uh, thank you to my partner in crime, Hannah, and thanks to everyone for attending. Hey, Ben, also, perhaps you should let people know that both you and I will be in Geneva for the public forum. So if they want to meet in person, if you guys, we're actually planning on, you know, hanging out in the night, uh, one of the evenings at a pub someplace. Um, so if you guys want to meet us there, if you guys have ideas, because our three-year birthday is coming up, uh, things that are coming up uh, that you would like us to see and keep these conversations going as always in the LinkedIn group. It's a really exciting place. 2000 people are in it about. Uh, and also I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank not just Ben for putting together this amazing webinar and the career one. He did both of them for you. So applause for that. To Hildegun and Amrita for being here again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And also it, that you might know that this is a very collaborative event, TPR Forum. So we have an amazing advisory board and also Ricardo and Karen who handle the website for us uh, and Jeffrey and Sylvia who are helping us with, um, with all the work that's going on. So, and also if you wanna get involved, that's, you know, just let us know. There's plenty of room here for everybody. So thank you so very much and we'll see you all in the fall. Have okay. a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.